Good morning, everybody. It's 9 o'clock, and we are ready to start. Um, my name is Tanya Popovich, and I coordinate these events. And I'm delighted to see that room is filling up. And I would like to welcome you to the first session in 2010. Um, just as a kind reminder that all the information about the Grand Rounds you can find on the Director's web page. We also have an external web page, and I'm also welcoming all the colleagues who are watching and listening outside of CDC, and that community is getting uh, larger by the minute. Um, I am delighted to let you know that this is the first session that is formally and officially available for the continuing education credits. And yesterday we sent a wide CDC-wide announcement about this, and you might as well go to the web and learn more about how you can um, sign for this. I'm also delighted to say that we are coordinating these events with our science um, clips, and I'd like to stay, uh, thank our colleague uh, Steve Wasilek, who has selected the polio uh, articles for this week's uh, edition of our science clips. Uh, finally, as always, we love the feedback, and so please continue to provide it either to our official web page or to Shane or myself directly. And just to give you a sense that we actually do look at what people say, this is a very limited feedback, but still in numbers, feedback that we got from our partners on our session that took place last month on food safety. And, and number six is the one that I'm actually most delighted to see, which basically says that 80% of the people strongly agree that they would come and listen and attend the next Grand Round session. And I think that, that's really uh, wonderful to see. Uh, just to keep your interest going, these are the sessions that are lined up for the next four months, and I have just sent an announcement for the next group of sessions that will be going on from June until October. Uh, I would like to remind you that these sessions go for 75 minutes, uh, hour and 15 minutes, not an hour, and that was by popular demand to allow about 15 or 20 minutes time for the discussion. And I'm inviting our director to say a few words. Good morning. Polio eradication is an enormous challenge and an inspiring effort. And the theme of the public health grand rounds is from rigorous science to impactful practice. And I think in polio, we have at various phases from the decision to try to eradicate polio in 1988 to the progress until now to the real concerns we have now about the future trajectory of eradication, uh, we have the need for both of those things, rigorous science and impactful practice. Uh, I think, as you'll see, uh, recent trends have not been as favorable as we would have liked. In fact, we have seen the progress reversed in many parts of the world. And I think when we think about rigorous science, we need to think about the rigorous analysis, both of the biology but also of the practice. Do we still have that mission-driven, program-specific, effective reach? Because it is enormously challenging. It's a program that requires, and is based on a model, that requires good surveillance for acute flaccid paralysis, but also requires program implementation. The challenge is enormous, because you have to reach essentially every community, but the payoff is enormous because you have the potential to benefit every community in the world. And I think as we look at the uh, challenges that you'll be hearing about today, I think we always have to remember that genetic and environmental explanations for program failure are diagnoses of exclusion. And we have to first assume that perhaps it's a problem with program implementation, with vaccine efficacy, with vaccine a production uh, with something that we are doing rather than something that we can't control. And uh, from, from my uh, five years of having had the privilege of working in India, including uh, pretty extensive work in Bihar and UP, I understand the challenges of Bihar and UP, uh, but I would be very reluctant to say that it's something about the environment uh, that's causing uh, the uh, the challenges in the epidemiologic impact rather than the challenges in the program. So I think that's a, an important diagnosis of exclusion. 
That is all by way of saying that this is an enormously important, challenging, and complicated issue, and I look very much forward to the presentations and discussions. Thank you very much for your work pre preparing it. Thank you, Dr. Fried, and good morning. I'm Steve Kochi. I'm the Senior Advisor in the Global Immunization Division, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Here is an outline of the session today. I'll kick it off, and then we'll hear from Drs. Hamid Jaffrey, Mark Palanch, and Walter Dottle. My objective is to provide a brief global picture of polio. Here's an outline of what I will be covering this morning. I'll start with some background, including progress since 1988, the year when global polio eradication uh, began. I will also introduce the main remaining challenges to completing polio eradication and highlight the critical importance of India to ultimate success of polio eradication. I'll start with some background. In 1988, based in large part on the successes of the Pan American Health Organization's 1985 goal to eliminate polio from the Americas by 1990, the World Health Assembly resolved to eradicate polio transmission globally by 2000. The Global Polio Eradication Initiative is an unprecedented public-private partnership spearheaded by four organizations working with national governments. It's coordinated by the World Health Organization, Substantial financial support and advocacy is provided by Rotary International. CDC has been a major technical and funding partner. And UNICEF is a source of vaccine, communication, and social mobilization support. Polio is an acute infection of humans caused by any of three serotypes of poliovirus, the types 1, 2, and 3. Polioviruses are RNA viruses that are part of the enterovirus genus. The mode of transmission is primarily person-to-person -person spread through the fecal-oral route. Polioviruses are highly infectious agents, and infection is ubiquitous in the absence of immunization. Paralytic disease is a rare outcome of poliovirus infections, occurring in 1%, less than 1% of instances. The paralytic potential of poliovirus varies by serotype with type 1 being the most neuro neurovirulent, followed by types 3 and type 2. Both a trivalent live attenuated oral poliovirus vaccine, or OPV, and an injectable inactivated poliovirus vaccine, or IPV, are available for routine immunization. Monovalent and bivalent preparations of OPV have been developed recently specifically to complete polio eradication. OPV has been the vaccine of choice for polio eradication because of its ease of administration orally, its low cost at 15 cents per dose, secondary transmission of live vaccine virus to close contacts, leading to contact immunization, and better intestinal immunity than IPV to prevent community spread of polioviruses. However, the disadvantages of OPV are that OPV has lower immunogenicity and effectiveness in tropical developing countries, and in rare instances, it can cause vaccine-associated paralytic polio. Four key strategies are used to stop transmission of polio worldwide and achieve its eradication. First, strengthening routine childhood immunization to ensure that infants receive four doses of oral polio vaccine during the first year of their lives. Secondly, conducting supplementary immunization activities, or SIAs. These are mass campaigns to provide additional doses of OPV targeting all children less than five years of age. Next, conducting surveillance for wild poliovirus through reporting and laboratory testing of all cases of acute flaccid paralysis among children less than 15 years of age. And finally, conducting intensive house-to-house -house targeted mop-up campaigns in focal areas around recently identified polio cases to eliminate the last potential or known reservoirs of poliovirus. These strategies first proved successful in the Americas and subsequently in nearly all countries of the world, an important lesson 
learned for developing countries is that routine immunization is not enough to stop polio transmission. Addition of SIAs is essential to prevent large polio outbreaks. Surveillance for cases of acute flaccid paralysis and for poliovirus is critical for guiding program activities as well as for documenting interruption of poliovirus transmission. Surveillance relies on two complementary components, AFP case investigations and virological studies of polioviruses obtained from stool specimens from AFP cases. A global network of 145 accredited laboratories has been established to process all stool specimens collected from AFP cases. More than 160,000 stool specimens were processed by this laboratory network in 2009. All wild and vaccine-derived poliovirises are genetically sequenced in specialized network laboratories to guide program action. CDC is a global specialized reference laboratory. Now a quick look at progress since 1988. Since 1988, global polio incidence has declined by more than 99% from an estimated 350,000 cases and 35,000 deaths in 125 countries, shown at the top of this slide, to 1,579 confirmed cases. Only four endemic countries remain in 2009, shown here in the TAN. We refer to these remaining four endemic countries by the acronym PAIN. That stands for Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, and Nigeria. The term endemic here refers to countries that have never interrupted wild poliovirus transmission. Excuse me. Although there was remarkable progress from 1988 to 2001 as measured by the rapid decrease in polio cases and the increasing number of countries that interrupted transmission, of wild poliovirus, the pace of progress first slowed by 2000 and then stagnated as seen in the inset line graph. Since 2005, the number of endemic countries that have never interrupted transmission of poliovirus has remained unchanged at four. All four of these countries have particularly weak health systems and low routine immunization coverage. And two of these, Afghanistan and Pakistan, have serious security issues. There we go. During 2003 to 2009, India and Nigeria have served as the two major reservoirs of poliovirus for importation into other countries that were once polio free. The countries shown in orange have been affected by imported virus of Indian origin and those shown in blue by virus of Nigerian origin. Consequently, previously polio free countries remained vulnerable to recurrent importations of poliovirus from the four endemic countries. Countries cur currently dealing with such importations are shown in this slide. In 2009, 23 countries reported polio, including 1,234 uh, polio cases from the four disease endemic countries shown in blue here, light blue, where transmission has never been eliminated. 141 from the four countries where poliovirus transmission was known or sus suspected to have been reestablished, which are shown in purple. These are Angola, Chad, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Sudan. And 204 cases in a further 15 countries in Western and Central Africa and the Horn of Africa due to new importations of poliovirus, which are shown in the light tan color. I will now introduce some challenges to completing global polio eradication, which fall into the general categories of failure to vaccinate and vaccine failure. These will be addressed in greater depth by subsequent speakers. Failure to vaccinate certain high-risk subpopulations of children remains a challenge in all four endemic countries. However, there's a wide variation by country in the contribution that failure to vaccinate plays. 
This slide shows the median age and vaccination status of polio cases in each of the four endemic countries for 2008 and 2009. The red bars denote unvaccinated or zero dose children and orange bars undervaccinated children with only one to three doses. While the dark green bars indicate highly vaccinated cases with seven or more doses of OPV. Note that Nigeria on the right is predominantly red and orange demonstrating that failure to vaccinate is the main contributing factor, while the cases in India on the left as a group are highly vaccinated. Pakistan and Afghanistan are intermediate between these two extremes. Now the issue of vaccine failure. Earlier I mentioned that OPV has lower immunogenicity and effectiveness in tropical developing countries. Attention therefore focused on develop, developing monovalent type 1 and type 3 vaccines to improve the effectiveness of vaccination by avoiding cross interference among the three serotypes that occurs following vaccination with a traditional trivalent OPV. These two clinical trials from Egypt and India demonstrate the superior immune response to monovalent OPV type 1 compared with trivalent OPV, either following one dose of vaccine given to newborn infants in Egypt on the left, or two doses given at birth and one month of age in India. Since 2005, monovalent type 1 and type 3 vaccines have been licensed and introduced globally in many countries as an additional tool to increase relative per dose zero conversion by two to three fold compared with trivalent OPV. Um, could I have some water, please? Sir? Empirically, it has been observed for decades that type 1 poliovirus is the most common serotype causing polio outbreaks spreads internationally more frequently and over greater distances than type 3 and has a higher case to infection ratio. To prioritize the elimination of type 1 transmission, monovalent OPV has, type 1 has been used preferentially in SIAs in the four remaining endemic countries. An unfortunate consequence of use of monovalent vaccines has been that the number of cases per year of types 1 and 3 has oscillated with the total annual number of cases varying from 1,300 to 2,000 since 2005. CDC experts have for many years advocated for development of bivalent OPV, including types 1 and 3, to avoid this potential oscillation. Following a clinical trial in 2009 in India, bivalent OPV has been recently licensed and its use is being scaled up globally this year, including in India, as you will hear. Now let me conclude by highlighting the critical importance of India to the ultimate success of global polio eradication. Historically, India has been the epicenter of poliovirus in the world. It has had the highest burden of paralytic polio of any country. And it continues to be a major exporter of poliovirus to other parts of the world. India has unique epidemiologic and technical challenges, which Hamid Jafri will now be elucidating for you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning. Uh, to set the background, um, it is important to uh, re-emphasize that the work on uh, global polio eradication is a major partnership effort. Specifically, the National Polio Surveillance Project is a collaboration of the World Health Organization and the uh, Government of India. Here is a brief outline of what I will be covering this morning. Uh, I will describe the recent history of polio in India, summarize the current status of uh, polio in India, discuss the major challenges to the eradication effort in India, and describe the strategy adjustments uh, in 2010 uh, to ensure polio eradication in the country. I will start with the recent history of polio um, in India. 
Here's a brief overview of the key events in the history of uh, polio in the country. India historically has had the highest estimated burden of paralytic polio in the world. In the late 70s, the annual polio burden was estimated to be more than 200,000 cases per year. OPV was introduced, that's the oral polio vaccine, was introduced as part of the Childhood Routine Immunization, or RI, in 1978. Polio substantially decreased after routine immunization was introduced, but the estimated number of cases was still between 50 to 100,000 per year. Supplementary immunization activities, or SIAs, uh, began in India in 1995. Uh, while poliovirus type 2 was eradicated in 1999, and in 2005, monovalent oral polio vaccines, uh, first for type 1 and then for type 3, were introduced in the SIAs. This slide depicts the monthly incidence of polio from 1998 through 2009. The red bars indicate wild poliovirus type 1, blue bars wild poliovirus type 3, and the few yellow bars visible in 1998 and 1999 indicate wild poliovirus type 2. The gray bars indicate clinical polio cases with unknown serotype. Active laboratory-supported surveillance together with clinical polio case reporting started in 1998 in India. The program shifted to only virologically confirmed case reporting in 2000. Surveillance sensitivity improved steadily initially and then more substantially since 2004. The differently colored arrows indicate different types of supplementary immunization activities. Black arrows depict national immunization days or NIDs. Blue arrows are for subnational immunization days and the green arrows are for large scale mopping up vaccination campaigns. Over the years, the frequency and scope of the subnational campaigns and large-scale mopping up vaccination has increased. The, the slide also indicates the resurgence of type 3 polio uh, in 2007, following introduction of monovalent type 1 in 2005 and its extensive use uh, subsequently. Despite substantial reduction, the persistence of type 1 polio is notable in the last three years. Following a series of NIDs, by 2002, all states in India, except Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, interrupted transmission of their indigenous poliovirus strains. The outbreak of polio in 2002 was caused by strains from western Uttar Pradesh. In 2009, nearly all polio transmission is restricted to Western UP and Central Bihar. Now, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar hold the key to successful eradication of polio from India. All polioviruses isolated outside of these two states since 2002 are related to strains circulating in one of these two states. Circulating strains in the two endemic states have frequently spread to each other. For example, Bihar stopped type 3 transmission for three and a half years, and then type 3 was then reintroduced from UP in 2007. On the other hand, Western UP stopped type 1 transmission for 16 months, but then type 1 was reintroduced into UP from Bihar in 2008. And given the extensive population movement from UP and Bihar to other parts of India, and between the two endemic states, it is imperative that elimination of poliovirus occur concurrently in these two states. Supplementary immunization activities, or SIAs, are conducted very frequently in UP and Bihar, usually eight to 10 rounds per year during the last three years. During each statewide SIA in these two states, 49 million houses are visited during house-to-house -house vaccination. Five million children are vaccinated while in transit on trains, train stations, bus terminals, etc. And a total of 58 million children under five years of age are vaccinated. The assessed routine immunization coverage with three trivalent OPV doses in UP and Bihar is 40% and 35% respectively. 
One of the reasons for the frequent SIAs in these two states is low routine trivalent immunization coverage among young children. I will now summarize the current status of polio in India. 89% of all polio cases uh, from 2007 through 2009 were due to type 3 polio virus. The type 3 epidemiology is largely explained by the vaccination strategy that is the preferential use of monovalent type 1 vaccine. Extensive use of type 1 monovalent vaccine in UP and Bihar has resulted in reduction of type 1 geographic spread as well as genetic diversity. Yet, transmission has persisted in around 80 wild polio virus type 1 cases have occurred annually during 2007 through 2009. Rest of India has maintained polio control using routine immunization and only two trivalent SIA rounds per year. Rest of India also conducts mopping up vaccination in response to cases following virus importation. Sorry, I didn't click the slide before. You can read this now. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about the characteristics of, of polio cases now. Uh, these pie charts depict the age distribution of polio cases in India. Polio in India remains a disease of children under five years of age, and among them, mostly children less than two years of age. Among children less than 12 months, most of the disease is in children 6 to 11 months of age. These pie charts show the vaccination status of polio cases. Categories include percentages of polio cases that have received no doses of OPV, that is zero dose, one to three doses of OPV, four to six doses, seven to nine doses, and ton or more doses. In recent years, polio cases have occurred among highly vaccinated populations in India. Two-thirds of the polio cases report receipt of 10 or more doses, and more than 80% report seven or more doses. Muslims appear to be overrepresented among polio cases in India. 13% of the overall population in India is Muslim according to the 2001 census. The proportion of Muslims among cases increases when the number of cases is higher in western Uttar Pradesh where a larger percent of the population is Muslim. Conversely, this proportion declines when cases increase in Bihar and Eastern UP or elsewhere, as is seen from the 2008 pie chart. I will next review the challenges to the polio eradication program in India. The polio eradication program in India has faced the two fundamental challenges, failure to vaccinate and vaccine failure. Both of these challenges are compounded by the population size and conditions in which the socio-economically disadvantaged populations live, particularly UP and Bihar. One of the challenges that resulted in failure to vaccinate was the resistance to vaccine acceptance in the Muslim minority communities of Western UP. This resistance peaked around 2002. In addition, there have been SIA quality problems due to weakness in planning, implementation, monitoring, and lack of corrective timely action. Until recently, significant proportions of children in certain hard-to-reach populations have been missed. I will describe each of these challenges in the subsequent slides. But even among well-vaccinated populations, there is evidence of vaccine failure due to suboptimal effectiveness of oral polio vaccine. Until 2004, there was substantial resistance to OPV in many Muslim minority communities of Western UP. Muslim children were under-vaccinated compared to their Hindu counterparts. Following extensive social mobilization and engagement of local leaders and institutions, the disparity in vaccination rates has been eliminated. Refusal to vaccinate is now at an all-time very low levels, less than 0.1%. Families in high-risk areas of Western UP refuse vaccination in SIA rounds. The pie charts on the left depict OPV vaccination rates in 2002 among non-polio acute flaccid paralysis case patients 6 to 59 months of age. Patients with non-polio AFP can be considered as surrogates for the general population of children of this age group. 
the OPV dose categories are the same as shown in the earlier slide on vaccination status of polio cases. 40% of Muslim children had received three or fewer OPV doses compared with 20% Hindu children. 11% of Muslim children had never been vaccinated. However, this disparity between the two groups has been eliminated. In 2000 and more, 2008, more than 80% of both the groups had received 10 or more OPV doses, and more than 90% of children in both groups had received seven or more OPV doses. The 2008 data also indicate the overall improvement in vaccination status of children compared with 2002. Regarding quality of uh, SIAs, these are maps of UP, Uttar Pradesh district, showing percent of children missed um, during an SIA round. Overall, less than 3% children are missed in UP and less than 1% in Bihar. The Bihar data are not shown on this slide. The quality and coverage of SIAs are better in Western UP compared with Eastern UP. The differences in quality is really related to the priority given by the program to the endemic areas of Western UP. With respect to reaching all children, a larger proportion of children has been missed during SIAs in certain hard to access areas and population groups. These include the Kosi River floodplains of Bihar, where wild type one transmission has remained entrenched, and the migrant populations who are difficult to reach because of their mobility and their temporary settlement sites. This Google image shows the confluence of Kosi River and the Ganges and multiple rivulets that make up the flood plain where mobility and access to children is extremely difficult. Superimposed are type one polio cases from 2007 to 2009 in this area. All type one strains isolated in India during 2008 and 2009 are genetically closely related to the wild polio virus type one strain persisting in this area. This, these photos show the scattered field huts with small children and the difficult terrain for mobility in this area. Supervision and monitoring of SIAs are extremely difficult. The program in India has considerably intensified its human and logistic support to this area, including more intensive monitoring. This bar graph indicates that until early 2009, up to 13% children were being missed in the field huts of Kosi area. In recent SIA rounds, this percentage has declined to around 4%. Overall in Bihar, less than 1% children are, are found unimmunized during surveys conducted at the end of each SIA round. Regarding vaccination of mobile populations, this slide shows data from surveys of children conducted at the end of each SIA round in Uttar Pradesh. A higher proportion of children in the migrant groups is missed during SIAs compared to the settled population. In September 2009, 700,000 children of migrant groups were vaccinated in more than 30,500 mobile population settlements in Uttar Pradesh. In summary, the resistance uh, to vaccination in minority communities has been largely overcome. Overall, high coverage is being achieved in SIAs. Less than 3% children in UP and less than 1% in Bihar overall are found unimmunized at the end of an SIA round. More than 80% of the polio cases have received seven or more OPV doses. The coverage among hard to reach populations has improved considerably. Only around 4% are being missed per round. The challenge of failure to vaccinate has largely been addressed. Coverage levels in India are higher than almost anywhere else in the world. In the subsequent slides, I will describe to you the challenge of vaccine failure in India as a result of the suboptimal effectiveness of the oral polio vaccine. This slide shows data on median seroconversion rates following three doses of trivalent OPV in developing countries. 
The data are based on a review of published studies from developing countries. Compared with type 2 polio, the median zero conversion rates for type 1 and 3 polio are substantially lower in tropical developing country settings. Zero conversion rates for all three serotypes exceed 95% in developed countries. Recognizing the persistence of polio among vaccinated populations, a case control analysis was undertaken based on the acute flaccid paralysis surveillance data with the objective to estimate the protective effectiveness of trivalent OPV and monovalent OPV type 1 against type 1 polio. The estimates of per dose effectiveness varied by type of vaccine and geographic location within India. Trivalent OPV estimates were lowest in UP at 11%. By comparison, the per-dose effectiveness of monovalent type 1 was 30% per dose in UP. These differences in effectiveness estimates are statistically significant. By 2004, epidemiologic data suggested that despite high trivalent OPV coverage, certainly at a level that was sufficient to interrupt transmission in the rest of India, Poliovirus transmission was continuing in Western UP and Bihar. In addition, occurrence of polio in well-vaccinated children confirmed that a part of the underlying challenge in UP and Bihar was failure of trivalent OPV. The India Eradication Program was thus advised by its advisory group uh, to take a number of steps, increase frequency of SIAs, improve coverage of SIAs, and use of monovalent oral polio vaccines. The implementation of these three strategies led to substantial progress against type 1 polio described in the next few slides. To confirm the impact of these strategies, the primary set of questions that the program had to answer were, first, are we really reaching all the children in the high-risk districts of Western UP? And secondly, if we are reaching the children, is the monovalent type 1 vaccine effective in inducing serologic protection? To answer these Two questions, the program assisted by CDC conducted two zero surveys in a district of Western UP in 2007 and then again in 2009. We also conducted serological survey of acute flaccid paralysis case patients during 2008 and 2009 in 25 districts that make up Western Uttar Pradesh. This table compares polio serif prevalence among six to nine month old children in a district of UP during 2007 and 2009. Compared with just over 80% zero prevalence against type 1 polio observed in 2007, 99% of the children in the same age group were zero positive in 2009. Associated with more frequent use of monovalent type 1 vaccine in 2008 and 2009, compared with 2007, there was a decline in polio type 3 zero prevalence from 71% in 2007 to 48% in 2009. Very similar results were obtained in the zero prevalence study of non-polio AFP case patients across Western UP. More than 95% type 1 zero prevalence in 6 to 11, 12 to 23, and 24 to 59 month old children was observed. Type 3 zero prevalence was much lower, ranging from 40% to just over 70% in the three age groups. In summary, there is now clear evidence of high immunogenicity of monovalent vaccines in endemic and non-endemic settings in India. High levels of serologic immunity against type 1 polio uh, is present in Western UP. Low levels of serological immunity prevail against type 2 and type 3 in Western UP. Regarding impact of these strategies on type 1 polio circulation, the genetic diversity of type 1 polio assessed by the number of genetically distinct clusters of closely related strains declined substantially. Of the 12 genetic clusters of type 1 wild poliovirus circulating in 2005, only three survived into 2008, and only one cluster has been detected in 2009. While this is encouraging progress, circulation of the type 1 cluster has persisted through 2009. The continuation of type 1 transmission in parts of Western UP and Bihar remains a major concern. 
I will now discuss the steps we have taken to better understand the situation of poliovirus transmission and potential adjustments to our eradication strategy. The low type 3 seroprevalence observed is consistent with the outbreaks of type 3 poliovirus that have occurred during 2007 through 2009. Despite high type 1 seroprevalence, while type 1 poliovirus transmission has persisted through 2008 and 2009 in Western UP and Bihar. So one of the major strategy adjustments in 2010 will be the use of a type 1 and type 3 bivalent OPV that has recently become available. This slide shows the results of a recent clinical trial in India comparing immunogenicity of bivalent OPV with trivalent OPV, monovalent OPV type 1, and monovalent OPV type 3 against type 1 and type 3 poliovirus. Seroconversion to type 1 and type 3 polio following two doses of bivalent OPV was just over 80%, which is superior to that achieved after two trivalent OPV doses. These differences are statistically significant. Compared with the respective monovalent vaccines, seroconversion levels following bivalent OPV against type 1 and type 3 polio were not inferior. These differences are not statistically significant. Thus, for bivalent OPV, use will enable control of wild type 3 without losing the high levels of immunity built to eliminate type 1 poliovirus. This slide summarizes the perspective of the government of India towards current and potential strategies to achieve polio eradication. Many in the government and among experts believe that continuation of the current intensive vaccination strategy, now supplemented by bivalent OPV, will be sufficient to achieve success. The government is encouraged by the high levels of type 1 zero protection and the previous cessation of type 1 transmission in UP. With respect to immunization strategies, the government is reluctant to introduce the inactivated polio vaccine because of concerns related to operational feasibility of achieving high coverage with an injectable vaccine. Risks associated with loss of public confidence in the current OPV strategy and the unclear impact of IPV on poliovirus transmission. The government is also reluctant to consider any major change in the OPV vaccination target age group, for example, vaccinating older children who may be participating in polio transmission. Again, the concerns are insufficient evidence to support this shift and the operational feasibility of reaching older children. On the other hand, there is increasing interest in exploring and implementing interventions that are not related to vaccination. This in particular includes strategies to improve environmental sanitation and access to clean water, especially in areas of persistent polio transmission. The government is also reluctant to continue with intense eradication activities indefinitely and will reassess progress and the need to continue by the end of 2011. So in summary, high levels of vaccine coverage have been achieved in India. High frequency of SIAs has largely overcome the limitations of lower vaccine effectiveness. There remains a fundamental lack of understanding why it is so difficult to stop transmission in parts of UP and Bihar. Additional substantial changes to the India program strategy should be plausible, feasible, and evidence-based. Research is therefore a current program priority to better understand transmission risk factors and potential options for changes in strategy. I'm now going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Mark Palash, who will describe the polio research issues in India. Over to you, Mark. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Palanch, and I'm the chief of the Polio and Coronavirus Laboratory branch. Uh, Hamad has just described some results of research that have impacted the planned program activities in India, for example, bivalent OPV. The focus of my presentation will be the potential of other recent and planned research to accelerate polio eradication as related to the challenges in UP and Bihar. The research activities recommended by experts, group, uh, expert groups relate to the key questions listed on this slide in the areas of serologic and mucosal immunity and risk factors for transmission. 
These include questions concerning use of IPV to achieve higher rates and faster seroconversion, insufficient mucosal immunity and resulting transmission in immune children, the possible role for IPV to fill gaps in mucosal immunity, the role of waning immunity in older children and the benefit of boosting mucosal immunity, and better understanding of the indirect risk factors associated with polio transmission. Any major changes in the eradication strategy will depend on the answers that might be obtained to these questions through research. Research plays a critical role in testing assumptions, evaluating the effectiveness of new intervention activities, and addressing new research questions. Ultimately, this forms the basis for providing the science-based evidence to inform policy. I will start with looking at two examples of re-examining our assumptions about serologic and mucosal immunity and how this leads to potential new interventions. The first example I will describe is the importance of rapid acquisition of immunity in young infants. Rapid acquisition of serologic immunity will clearly protect infants from disease. Accelerating immunity in the very young is further assumed to interrupt transmission because of the critical role of infants in sustaining virus circulation. As previously noted, routine immunization of young infants is very poor in areas of UP and Bihar, but poor routine immunization is not unique to the endemic areas. Substantial use of monovalent OPV1 has provided better control of wild poliovirus 1 in UP and Bihar compared to the use of trivalent OPV. However, despite the fact that monovalent OPV1 stopped wild poliovirus 1 circulation in western UP once, it did not prevent the reestablishment of transmission subsequently after importation from Bihar. The per-dose vaccine effect effectiveness of IPV is higher than any OPV. This leads to the reasonable expectation that an even more effective vaccine, for example IPV in addition to OPV, will lead to acquisition of immunity more quickly, leading to stopping polio transmission. A study using IPV was completed in 2009 in Western UP. Hamid has already mentioned this clinical trial from Western UP with regard to the high baseline seroprevalence to type 1 among 6 to 9 month old children whose SIA doses were all monovalent OPV1. In the context of re-examining assumptions, the baseline seroprevalence in the same children to types 2 and 3 as a function of the number of routine immunization doses they have received is shown. In contrast to the poor performance of T, uh, trivalent OPV implied by the earlier case control analysis for type 1 that Hamid also presented, these data would seem to confirm the benefits of trivalent OPV in routine immunization and support the continued efforts to improve routine immunization concurrent with improved coverage and frequency of SIAs. In this same study, children were given a single dose of IPV either intradermally or intramuscularly. Among those children who were seronegative to type 2 at the time of enrollment, all 89 responded to intramuscular IPV as seen in the second and third bars. This demonstrates the excellent ability of IPV to boost immunity in previously immunized children and is consistent with the superior performance of IPV demonstrated previously in other parts of the developing world, including other parts of India. Returning to this assumption, despite the demonstrated effectiveness of multiple OPV vaccinations, the potential benefit of IPV to accelerate the acquisition of serologic immunity is clear. However, these studies do not address the link between rapidly acquiring or boosting of immunity by IPV and reducing or stopping transmission. The second example of re-examining a fundamental assumption I would like to describe is assuming that the age of paralytic polio cases is a reflection of the age for the majority of virus transmission. While it may have been unnecessary to question this assumption in the majority of countries that successfully eliminated polio transmission, this issue has really never been addressed systematically since the 1950s in the pre-vaccine era. The characteristics of polio cases are readily described through the AFP surveillance activities. 
For example, in UP and Bihar, the median age of wild poliovirus cases is around 18 months, and only a small number of cases occur in older children. This is consistent with the high seroprevalence in children between 36 and 60 months of age. From this and similar data in the early years of the program, SIA activities have conventionally targeted children less than 60 months of age. Despite almost no direct evidence, this has indirectly reinforced the expectation that infection in immune and older children are not contributing in any important way to polio circulation. This graph shows a comparison of the age distribution of wild poliovirus cases and contacts. The number of wild poliovirus 1 cases on the left and the proportion of healthy contacts on the right that are isolation positive for wild poliovirus type 1 are shown. As can be seen, the age distribution of the healthy individuals does not mirror the age distribution of the wild poliovirus confirmed cases. This indicates that the ages of infection and clinical disease are not the same contrary to assumptions. The expectation was that detection should decrease by age as immunity increases by age. Therefore, improving the immunity status did not decrease the rate of wild polio virus 1 shedding. In Western UP, in a special enhanced surveillance activity, specimens were collected from household and community contacts of confirmed wild polio virus cases, including those over five years of age and tested for poliovirus. This graph shows that wild poliovirus 1 and wild poliovirus 3 were readily detected in community contacts uh, and that the rate of isolation in contacts five years of age and older was not statistically different than those in the age group less than five that are targeted for vaccination during SIAs. A different type of enhanced surveillance activity was conducted in the Kosi River floodplain of Bihar that Hamid described to you earlier. In a part of this area with a population of 150,000 people that had seven recent wild poliovirus 1 cases, specimens were collected from 250 randomly selected households. Similar to the results in UP, this slide shows that the percentage of children infected in the age group five to nine years of age is comparable to that less than five in this limited sample. Both of these results demonstrate that while poliovirus infection rates in older children are similar to those in the age group that is targeted for vaccination. Returning to the second assumption, the age distribution of infections was not as expected and does not match either the ages of clinical disease nor the targeted age groups for vaccination. Since the decision on which ages to vaccinate is a legacy from the earliest times of the program, a potential new intervention is to change the ages of the target population. Uncertainties, however, remain both in terms of the importance of this finding and data to indicate that the proposed intervention will have a positive result in reducing transmission and therefore make stopping polio circulation easier. This research and other data lead to the design of new interventions. I will now describe examples of potential interventions and how they can be evaluated in research studies. For IPV, the research question should be focused on the ability of IPV to reduce virus shedding since the superiority in achieving serologic immunity is already demonstrated. However, in considering new interventions, it is important to account for the pragmatic aspects of both the research and the potential interventions. For example, the absence of major elements of a functioning health infrastructure in northern India makes large-scale use of IPV a major logistical obstacle, as described by Hamid. Understanding the operational issues is an equally important consideration with vaccine effectiveness, but could be addressed through a more limited pilot study. Research studies themselves represent a considerable investment. Combining study questions into single studies can greatly improve the efficiency and timeliness of obtaining results. The example shown here can address both IPV and OPV effectiveness on reducing virus shedding in older immune age groups. In this proposed study, older children would be vaccinated with either IPV or bivalent OPV at enrollment, and then the effect on shedding can be measured following a challenge dose of bivalent OPV 
one month later. Reduction in shedding as measured weekly following the challenge would be considered a proxy for reduction of virus transmission. Although I do not have time to describe them, I would like to mention other research that could contribute to understanding suboptimal vaccine effectiveness. In addition to the two examples cited, additional studies are being considered or planned to investigate factors that have either been demonstrated or suspected of being important for vaccine effectiveness or risk of virus exposure. The list of factors shown is not exhaustive but are only examples. Results of these additional studies could lead to consideration of other potential interventions. I hope in this brief presentation I've been able to describe in a few examples the ongoing role for research to identify potential new interventions to supplement the current efforts to eliminate the continuing circulation of polio in UP and Bihar. Among the many potential research studies described both here and by Hamid, some, such as those that are based on enhanced surveillance to look at age distribution of infections, will continue in 2010. It is hoped that some of the proposals, such as the effect of boosting on older children with IPV and OPV and on virus shedding, will begin soon. Finally, it is vitally important that these efforts include synthesis of data, logistical requirements, resource needs, and estimates of cost effectiveness to address the needs of policymakers. In these three presentations, you have heard about the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and the critical importance of India to that goal. The activities and achievements of the program in India to meet the extraordinary challenges in UP and Bihar, and the role that research can play in providing potential new tools and approaches for insurance that polio eradication in India will be achieved. And now, Walt Dowdle will provide his perspective. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, let's stop back for a minute and look at eradication. And disease eradication is made possible by a constellation of four conditions. And that's biologic feasibility, that means a human reservoir, it means having a vaccine, it means having drugs, or it means having some environmental intervention. It means adequate public health structure to get the job done and sufficient funding to support that infrastructure. And it, most of all, requires a political will to see the job through. So where the constellation exists, the disease doesn't. Developed countries don't need an international declaration. And as a matter of fact, smallpox and polio were eradicated long ago. Smallpox, I mean, polio in particular was eradicated back in the 1960s in many developed countries. Global eradication requires an international declaration primarily to assist the developing countries and to provide a commitment to those countries. The current international official eradication goals are guinea worm and polio. Guinea worm started about the same time as polio. It started with about 3 million cases. It is now down to 500. It's been difficult. It has not been easy, but it's been a fantastic job. And I think those of you at CDC who've been involved in supporting this program should be very proud. Polio is a little more difficult and a little different story. Smallpox, not that it was easy, but in many ways is far less complex biologically than, and logistically than is polio. Polio has three types as opposed to one, unapparent infection as opposed to clinically apparent, and of course the vaccines are far less effective. Now here we are, 22 years, $7 billion after the World Health Assembly resolution, and eradication still remains elusive. On the other hand, some see polio as no longer a problem, having been reduced from greater than 350,000 cases to about 1,500 cases today. And that's quite an accomplishment. So the question has been put forward is why not declare victory, forget eradication, and revert to control? Well, the answer is easy, and that is control is not the answer. How quickly we forget 
because it was 30 years that we tried control through routine immunization in developing countries and totally failed to prevent recurring major epidemics. That's the reason why the eradication was started in the first place in the Americas, because routine control didn't work. Epidemics result from pools of susceptible persons through vaccine failure and failure to vaccinate. Even countries with high immunization coverage have immunization gaps among the high-risk subpopulation, the Netherlands being a good example. 25 countries have routine immunization coverage of less than 60%. And outbreaks will always remain a risk as long as polio virus is circulating. When Nigeria stopped polio immunization in 2003 and then four, the result was that polio was exported into 27 polio-free countries in 92 separate incidents. It cost greater than $500 million for additional emergency funding and greater than 5,000 children were needlessly paralyzed. Now, if we think about high control, which is what has been proposed, that is to maintain control with the same level of cases. Well, if we talk about high control, this will mean that there's no reduction in vaccine coverage, just as now, continued global surveillance network, just as now, it means emergency vaccine stockpiles. It means aggressive outbreak response. In short, it's the same strategy as for eradication, but it goes on forever. It's indefinite. Now, if you think about the cost of high control over a 20-year period, that is just like we're doing right now, and in fact have been doing for the last five years or so, and it would, it's an estimated $10 billion to maintain polio at current level, and, of course, I think we would all agree that high control is never economically optimal if eradication is at all feasible. It just doesn't make sense to keep putting out the same money over and over and over. Now, if we look at low control, and the low control, which is what most people would like to move to, and that is routine immunization only, over a 20-year period, it would cost about $3.5 billion for vaccine. That is indeed a considerable savings. On the other hand, what it does do, it places the burden on at least the um, poorest of the poor with about 200,000 cases per year. So this is quite a price to pay. So low cost, effective control in polio is an oxymoron. It just simply isn't possible. Now, also, if we look at indefinite high polio control using OPV, there are other prices to pay as well. And it means continuing OPV-associated paralytic poliomyelitis of about 250 to 500 cases per year. It means periodic polio outbreaks caused by OPV-derived viruses. And it means chronic shedding of OPV-derived viruses and infection of immunodeficient persons. The final goal is not just wild polio virus, but the final goal is eradication of poliomyelitis of any origin. Routine use of saving OPV must stop, affordable IPV must be available, and the absence of circulating OPV-derived viruses must be assured. And polio viruses, like smallpox viruses, must be either destroyed or contained in a limited number of essential facilities. We have to keep in mind, we have to keep telling ourselves that polio er eradication is achievable. And of course, the last stretch is most challenging. The more successful we are, the less interest there is in the program. Targeted research, innovation, and program flexibility are absolutely critical. And as pointed about by, Ham by Hamid and, and also by Mark. But we have to remember that only in parts of four countries has eradication never been achieved. Now, in order to move forward, the polio program must reach out to other international health initiatives and partners. We must invigorate the uh, global program. And all international health initiatives must recognize that the mutual benefits of supporting polio eradication, the mutual benefits. And I think we should keep in mind that eradi polio eradication is not some stovepipe program out there that takes money and, um, and, and creates a sort of a diversion. In fact, the program affects us all. 
polio eradication is crucial for that very same reason, for all children at risk now and in the future in the developed world, for all diseases where eradication is a potential goal. The outcome of polio eradication is going to affect whatever plans you might have for measles, for neglected tropical diseases, or other agents for which, control, for which eradication is now being considered. And for all international health initiatives that will share directly or indirectly in this remarkable global achievement. Now, the benefits of polio eradication would be shared by all. And I'd like to end, the, end this uh, presentation with a quote from Bill Feige, and that is, eradication, unlike control, provides social justice and health equity for all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Walt. Now I'd like to open the floor to uh, questions from the audience, including the Envision audience. We have about 10 minutes uh, for any questions or comments. Please uh, step up to the microphone. Thank you. You remind me of, in the 1980s, the World Bank held a debate on polio eradication, and I was asked to be a debater. I didn't want to be, but I knew it was the only way that I would understand what the opposition was. And the opposition turned out to be only two things of importance. Number one, people said this is neocolonialism. It's telling Africa how they should be spending their health money. I countered by saying I would prefer to think of Gandhi saying his idea of the golden rule was he shouldn't be able to enjoy something not enjoyed by everyone. And I said, if we can enjoy having children and grandchildren who don't have to worry about polio, everyone should. The other argument was the one Walt brought up, what does this do to other health systems? And I think it's very important that we keep thinking, how do we strengthen the rest of the health system? For instance, routine childhood immunization for all the problems of IPV, and, and I should say it was CDC that recommended IPV in 1992 based on studies in Sierra Leone, for all the problems of implementing this in UP, think of what this could do to the routine immunization system. The last thing, Tom started with the question, uh, are there logical explanations for what happens in UP? And I really think this is a cascade of things coming together. We start with a vaccine that isn't very good. I mean, when you have to give six and eight and 10 doses, that's not a great vaccine. We then look at something not mentioned, and that is the titer of the vaccine in India has been lower than what people thought it was. Studies have now shown that we're not using as good a titer. Number three, all the competition with other intestinal organisms, a population density that is very great. My guess is if you had modelers that really had all the information, they would say this is to be expected. You don't have to go to a genetic difference of people and so forth. But I agree totally with Walt. We can't settle for anything less than eradication. We, we have too much invested to stop at this point, and we simply have to figure out what are these problems, how do we solve them. By year numbers, from in you had nadirs in 2002 and 2006. Uh, do you think this is just the kind of natural cycling of infection where you have a pooling of susceptibles that lead to nadirs, or did the program relax in those years? And then, or something go wrong with the quality of vaccine that might in fact be giving us a pool of older children and even adults who are less. Uh, 
immune, less susceptible to clinical disease, and may be important as, as reservoirs and, and sources? That's the first question. Second question is, you, you showed impressive data on IPV in a tiny number of children in terms of its biological effectiveness. I think the question might be to look at a community effectiveness trial uh, taking some of the more difficult areas, probably in Bihar, where you, if you're going to do something in a study area, it's best not to do it in an area that has a lot of vaccine reluctance and suspicion, um, and see whether you could uh, document an interruption of transmission and model the impacts on the community. OK, I'll uh, go ahead and take the first question, and uh, I'll ask Mark to uh, uh, to lead off on the second question. Uh, I think there are a number of factors that are involved in the the oscillation that we've seen since uh, 2000, but uh, 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 letting up on the program has not been uh, has not been one of them. Uh, what we saw, I think, with the resurgence since 2002, really uh, was largely due to the uh, a cessation of uh, polio vaccination in parts of northern Nigeria beginning in 2003 that led to a, a very uh, considerable resurgence uh, and an increase in uh, the number of cases uh, sub subsequent to, uh, uh, to that um, cessation of vaccination. We, we, did, we do have a little bit of cycling, as you saw, as recently as 2006, and I think that's because of difficulties that the program has faced in balancing the use of monovalent type 1 vaccine as compared to type 3 vaccine. With the uh, uh, disproportionate uh, emphasis on the use of the monovalent type 1 vaccine, there was a resurgence in uh, type 3 cases uh, in Nigeria and in uh, in India, that uh, that probably accounts for what you saw on the on the uh, line graph. How about the issue that Dr. Fagi raised of the vaccine titers, the, the quality of vaccine? Well, I think um, in in terms of the India context, uh, 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 Hamid can speak to that, but. Uh, I, we don't believe that uh, a low vaccine uh, potency of, the o of OPV has been a, a, cons uh, ma a major factor. There have been isolated instances, including in India, where a specific lot might be borderline. And uh, Hamid, you might uh, mention that specific instance. Yeah, I, I did want to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, it's absolutely right. I mean, we've had a, a outbreak in 1998, then a type 1 outbreak in 2002 and then another type 1 outbreak in 2006. So with this observation time, it was very tempting for a, lot, a number of people, including experts, were saying that this is a cyclical, it's accumulation of susceptibles. And then there is an opposite camp that uh, says that you, there are a number of explanations for this. The quality of surveillance has not remained the same. And there are other indicators other than case counts that indicate progress in terms of disappearance of genetic diversity of polioviruses, uh, et cetera. And we don't know the definitive answer, but we hope to find out this year because we are, according to that logic, due for a type 1 outbreak this year. So, and we are trying to, pre in fact, eradicate type 1 this year. And if we succeed, we'll know for sure whether this is a true cycle uh, that happens with some accumulation of susceptibles or, or that we are able to break uh, that cycle this year. Um, in terms of vaccine potency, this, of course, has been a, a, an important question. And as you can imagine, that's always the first line of defense of the government of UP that there is something wrong with the vaccine. So it's something that has been extensively studied. We did go through a, a period whereby from one of the Indian manufacturers, there was an issue of the stability where the titers were declining over, over time. But it is very interesting that that vaccine was used just before the seroprevalence study was done in Western UP. So that those titers that came down from 10 to 6 to around you know 10 to 5.8 or so, certainly didn't seem to have affected the immunogenicity as we were able to observe it in these Western UP, uh, UP children. So, but there is an ongoing testing uh, that happens of the vaccine potency um, in, um, um, in India. Mark, do you want to add? Just to add that the, in, not in northern India, but in two other studies done in other parts of India, a high titer imported vaccine was directly compared to the uh, domestic product and there was no improvement in seroconversion in those clinical trials. Uh, to your point on the pilot studies, uh, these have been discussed now going on close to two years. 
Uh, and we agree completely that the practical side of things uh, in terms of operational research as well as understanding the effects at the population level are important. I think Hamid can comment in terms of some of the government of India perspectives on this, uh, but uh, what you're describing is exactly what's under consideration. Anne? 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 Yeah, I, I, this was really fantastic. I mean, I've been immersed in H1N1 for the past eight or nine months, and it is really extraordinary to see um, all that is, has happened since I last checked in. And I just the uh, first thing I want to say is, I think Thomas said before, you know, our influenza surveillance is just, you know, overwhelming. You know, we, we have so much better data on influenza than on almost anything, but I think we have better data on polio than anything in the world. It's just remarkable how much detail you really have about what's going on in India, um, you know, uh, biologically, um, socially, in terms of the, the coverage and so forth. Um, I wanted to get at one of Walt's factors about the political will and seeing the 24-month period that the government of India has apparently given and knowing how important learning has been to the polio eradication effort. Um, with, with our H1N1 response, we were pretty open about, you know, the enormous uncertainty that this is the best, you know, this is what we think makes sense, but we need to change at any moment. And that helped us with credibility to sort of acknowledge uncertainty. I guess I wonder how do you address um, the need for political will and confidence and also to sustain credibility that, you know, we think now we've got the four or five things that needs to be done, but we might not have thought of everything. And I, I just wonder, particularly in India, if you have an insight about working with the government of India and the, the scientists there and the program in you know, leading the charge, but also acknowledging that we have a lot that we need to learn, and that, that's why the research is so important. And that's, that's a key insightful question, because I think there has been loss of credibility uh, of the experts with the government of India. The program has been extremely innovative, and the government has really um, followed all the recommendations, and they are now tired after, after 15 years of intense eradication effort. And it was always an expectation was set that, you know, with these new major changes, we will see. Um, and uh, now the program has become more complex. So I think we're at that stage where we need to persuade them that this is a tough problem. And it will require tough leadership and persistence and resilience to get, get through uh, the program in India. And that's why, you know, this, is, this really needs a lot of advocacy at the senior level with the, with the government of India. But in terms of political will, I mean, the, in, I think next year, or the year after, they would have put in more than a billion dollars of their own funding, which actually started only in 2006 in a substantive way. And these are just the direct costs, not counting the, the workforce and other indirect costs that go into the program. So, so I think that's, uh, that's a very important um, question, is to build that will that it's a complex program. It's not going to work like it did in the rest of India or other places. We still need to learn a lot more. In, in, uh, we often think about sustainability of public health programs, and of course eradication is the ultimate in sustainability. So uh, we, we wish you all the best, and we are fully committed to supporting whatever it takes to get to the finish line. Thank you all very much. <laughs>